introduce somebody named Jerry Kivik Bio. I didn't know Bio was your last name. <laughs> okay, Jerry was born and raised in Washington State, where he attended high school and college and graduated from Central Washington University with a degree in education. Following college, a good thing to do, he joined the Army. Your brother joined the Navy, you joined the Army? Yeah, we try not to tell people about him. <laughs> he went to helicopter flight training, 35 year career, stationed numerous locations around the world, including a 16 month tour in the Middle East during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Well, that didn't work out too well, did it? He held several command and leadership positions, eventually reaching the rank of Colonel. After his career, he served as the Chairman of Flight Training Department at Emory Riddle in Prescott, Arizona for 12 years. He has a Master's Degree in Homeland Security and Emergency Management from American Military University. Well, we're safe around here with you in charge. Okay, no yeah. have an emergency, I'll be there. <laughs> he received numerous awards and decorations during his Army career, including the Von Starr, the Legion of Merit, and the Sikorsky Helicopter Rescue Award. No applause for you. You're doing this? I'm just going to do it. Are you? Okay. Yes, the bulb, the, the bulb is doing Okay, well, well uh, Katrina's doing that. First of all, you guys do an amazing job here. We couldn't do what we do here without you. Um, I see it every day. And uh, I personally appreciate what you guys do for the people down on the floor. True. Um, it's uh, World War II, 1943, over in England. The ladies' uh, garden club is having kind of a bond drive thing. They've got Captain Smith, who's in the Royal Air Force, and he's going to come talk to the group, and uh, you know they're going to collect some money afterwards and that kind of thing. So Mrs. Uh, Vaughn Smythe, she uh, is president of the club, and she introduces Captain Smith, who's going to talk about one of the missions. So Captain Smith gets up there, and he starts talking about the mission, and he said, we took off and we flew, you know, there was a formation of eight of us, and as soon as we went feet wet over the channel, the fuckers jumped us, and the fuckers were everywhere, and it was a big tangle, and the fuckers were, you know, shooting us down and all this stuff, and Mrs. Von Smythe, she says, hold on a second, for the ladies that might be offended by this, you know, what Captain Smith is talking about is a type of airplane when he says that word, fuckers, and... And uh, Captain Smith says, yes, ma'am, that's true. But in this case, these fuckers was Messerschmitt. <laughs> you guys hadn't heard that? Yeah. No. Uh, no? Okay. Um, I did. I spent, a, I spent a shitload of time in the Army, 35 years. I tell people I'm a slow learner. And um, the last thing I did was this combat tour in Iraq. And uh, I say combat. They were still rocketing us occasionally. I was team chief for a combat advisor team. This slideshow is way too long, so I'm gonna, we're going to bang through some of these as we roll. Um, but uh, the team consisted of Army, Navy, and Air Force personnel, contractors, you know, those Blackwater guys that you hear about that go overseas and make 200 grand a year. Some of those were on my team, and then I had about eight uh, interpreters. And they were from Lebanon and Egypt and uh, a couple from Iraq, that kind of thing, and uh, couldn't have done the job without the interpreters, as you might imagine. Um, this is just our patch. We made up a patch to go over there, and uh, we had some goofy guy who was a New Orleans fan, so we had to have a flirty lead. Okay, <laughs> next slide. Baghdad's got a shitload of oil. You know, Iraq, it's everywhere. And that's what this is, and they have 112.5 billion barrels, the second most in the, in the world. Okay, so that's why everybody's over there. If, if they didn't have that much oil, nobody would be there. Next slide. And this is a couple of, this is just how, I'm down here in Basra, you know, Baghdad's up here, and uh, this is how it was kind of divided up by the military initially. You can see the Brits were here down in uh, southern Iraq, and then we eventually took that over when the Brits, Brits went home. I was there, of course, when U.S. 1st Infantry Division was in charge of U.S. Division South, okay? Next slide, please. Yeah, it's going to go quick, Bob. Okay. Um, they had, they had the, the real, the largest military event in Basra was a thing called Charge of the Knights. It was a six-day event, and you know what? The bad guys were over there were militia. You remember, they were, they were kind of disorganized rabble, but they would get together, and so there was uh, an attempt to kind of finally move the militias out and replace them with military Iraqis, and so the Brits and the Americans and the Iraqi uh, displaced the Mahdi army, and they kind of just, uh, you know, melted into the desert like they do. And so that was the biggest event, and that happened before I got over there. Next slide, please. 
And then Basra. Basra is uh, supposedly the home of Sinbad the sailor. Basra is, uh, is supposed to be the Garden of Eden, uh, the biblical Garden of Eden. It used to look like this. It was a place that people from Europe went to. It was like uh, a jewel in the Middle East, that kind of a place. They, you know, uh, kings and queens went over there. Next slide, please. And uh, this is it in terrain. And you're, you know that after World War I, the Brits mostly are the ones who put these lines in the, gr in the ground. And they weren't traditional lines of where people were, you know, the Kurds and uh, the Shiites and the Sunnis and all that. The Brits didn't care much about that, so they drew lines, and, and this is what it ended up like. Again, I'm down here. Here's the Gulf. And, of course, the oil that the Iraqis have, it makes its way down here and goes and offshore right here. They have some uh, uh, filling ports where the tankers pull up. So it all happens offshore. So there's oil um, uh, pipelines going out here into the water and then filling up the tankers. So you can imagine that's a hot spot. Here's Kuwait right here. And you remember what happened in Desert Storm. Uh, they invaded Kuwait, decided that was their, Saddam decided that was their new province, uh, Kuwait was. And so it took them, you know, six days or whatever to overwhelm Kuwait. And then Desert Storm was about kicking them back out of there. And, uh, and then the follow-on, of course, is Iraqi freedom. <coughs> Next slide, please. Okay, Basra, a little bit closer. This is called the Shat al-Arab Waterway. You can see it right there. And the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, you know, they're, again, the cradle of civilization in the Middle East. The Tigris and Euphrates come together, and they form the Shat al-Arab Waterway. Uh, Basra sits on that waterway, and specifically... The old uh, fancy hotel that I was in with the Iraqis uh, is right there on the water. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, a, a filled out map, same thing. Uh, all these you hear about on the news, you know, Kirkuk and, and Baghdad, of course, uh, Kut, all these places, Amara, Basra, all that. All these are biblical. All these are uh, traditional locations within Iraq. Next slide, please. Okay, this was our... Uh, Combat advisor training in, in Fort, lovely Fort Polk. You have to say lovely in front of Fort Polk. It's actually the armpit of the country. Um, it's no fun whatsoever. But uh, this is what we focused on while we were there. And uh, it wasn't a flying gig. I'm, you know, I'm an Army aviator, but this was not a flying gig. When you make 06, they can make you do anything they want you to do. So they said, you got to go over there, and it's a ground assignment. So that's what this was. And uh, uh, lots of fun stuff in, in Fort Polk. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, this was our mission statement. This was the primary thing here, is assist the Iraqi military and their law enforcement, counterinsurgency, techniques, procedures, officer and enlisted professional development, liaison to foreign militaries, lots of that. There were other foreign militaries there, did a lot of liaison. Also with the State Department, they're there, you know, the Department of Defense. There were uh, Shars Affairs, there were, you know, there was an embassy in Baghdad, and there was a consulate down where I was in Basra. I spent a lot of time with them. And then, this was my favorite, which was synchronize U.S. combat effects as necessary to defeat insurgents, which means I got to call in the bad, the good guys if I needed to. Next slide. Just hit that and see if it'll play <laughs> while they're doing this. Uh, we spent two months in, at Fort Polk doing this combat advisor training. They've been training combat advisors at Fort Polk since before Vietnam. <laughs> A lot of those guys in Vietnam, of course, were in the jungle, living with the mountain yards, that kind of thing. Well, they trained at Fort Polk. They're still doing that. They're still producing teams to go do those things. There's teams in Afghanistan still. There's teams in Syria. Uh, it just depends on the conflict, and that's how they formed the, the teams, how they put them together. And so it's called Tigerland um, is where they do this stuff. There you go. The USB. The, it was all about our team training. We had to get combat lifesaver qualified. We had to learn Iraqi, you know, Arabic language. We shot all kinds of fun weapons, 40 millimeter uh, grenade launchers and 50 cal and all that stuff. We practiced a whole bunch of convoy operations, you know, getting uh, ambushed in, con in convoys. We practiced on up-armored Humvees all around Fort Polk. And then we got to Iraq and we didn't have up-armored Humvees at all. We had MRAPs. Anybody know what an MRAP is? The, you remember early on in Desert Storm when we were getting our... our um, <coughs> Humvees blown up and the guys were putting, people were sending metal over there so they could put metal armor on the sides and all that. Well, the up-armored hum or the uh, MRAP was Congress's step in to try to armor and protect our soldiers. 
Mine resistant, armor protected is what MRAP stands for. So we trained on the up armored Humvees and all we had when we got in country was MRAP. So we had to relearn everything about the operation of all that. This is sitting in Kuwait. When you, you go to Kuwait first, and you, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are little names here. So everybody that's flying out somewhere, you can see Califar right there, Al-Assad, is sitting waiting till they get shuffled on a bus and then they get shuffled over to an airplane and off you go to wherever you're going to end up in the Middle East. So it was, you know, 198 degrees there. Next slide. <laughs> okay, this is just, these are blast walls. They were everywhere. These are the, I had to spend the night there so they give you a tent and uh, you crash with a bunch of other people and then off you go the next day. But people love to decorate these blast walls. Next slide. <coughs> okay, more Bosra stuff. This is the, the, uh, the BAOP, the Basra Operations Command, but this is it in its glory day way back in the 30s and 40s when it was a hotel and a control tower and the runway's right out here. Next slide. So here's an airplane yeah. sitting out in front of the, that was the tower again. This was the hotel. It was a very fancy place. Um, you know, luxury hotel is what it was. It got referred in like the 60s. This is the 20s. Got referred in the 60s by the Brits and then uh, you'll see it here pretty soon the way I occupied it. This was just next to me. I took this picture so that when I go to the VA I can say, look, I was near one of those where they, <laughs> where they poisoned all of us. Next slide. Okay, so I'm taking this picture from the roof of the old hotel where I live. Okay, this is a compound in the center of a larger compound. You see this wall out here? There would be tanks parked in the corner. There's one right there. That's an Iraqi tank facing out. This is uh, Basra in the background, and so this interior section covered by blast walls and, and uh, the, you can see all these sand-filled uh, barriers here, sleeping tents, that kind of thing, mess hall. That's where uh, the rest of my team stayed. I was the only one staying in the hotel at night with the Iraqis. And then there was an MP company in there also, and they were our force protection. Because my team was not necessarily a combat team, we all had to go through all that, but we needed MPs just in case they decided to, you know, raid this compound. We were supposed to get our asses inside there and, you know, hunker down. Next slide. Okay, so this is the Shot Al Arab Waterway right behind the hotel. And what's normally parked here, and it wasn't in this thing, was some Navy Swift boats, the version that they have now of Swift boats. They're very heavily armored. They're very heavily armed. And so we had two of those Navy boats, Navy guys there all the time and uh, they were to protect the back door here in case the uh, militia guys decided to come in the back door. Next slide please. Okay, this is the hotel in the distance. Recognize the old control tower and uh, it's a shadow of its former self but this is from inside the U.S. compound and uh, these, that's the blue sauna, <laughs> affectionately known as the blue sauna. We had a guy with a thermometer and uh, he put it in there one time it went to 137 degrees and it was too hot for the flies. They died. So, so you know you got a bad shitter when the flies are dying. Next slide. Okay, this is a little island. This is called Sinbad Island, and it was right behind the hotel. But you can see, you know, this is Basra in the distance, and this is more of the Shot Al Arab waterway. Next slide. Okay, this is a little example of what it used to be like. You know, they had fancy gardens and, and fountains and that kind of thing. So Again, lots has happened since the shop out, or, or since the, uh, the hotel has been in its glory days. Next slide. Okay, that's just the front looking in. This used to be like, you know, in the old days it had a big um, awning here, you know, that kind of thing. Um, my room was right there, so when you walked in the front door, the first left was me. Next slide. Okay, you can see there's pock marks in here from uh, rounds hitting the building that happened during uh, one of the conflicts. Concertina wire laying around, you know, it's not maintained anymore in any semblance of anything. Lots of antenna stuff on top, that kind of thing. Next slide. This is one of the rooms in there, sandbagged up. The Iraqi guys would hang out. You can see there's a hookah, a couple of hookahs right here. The Iraqi enlisted guys would hang out and they'd also go up on the roof and do foul things. Next slide. It's true, it's all true. Um, this is my office. You know, I was the 06, I was the team chief, so I got a pretty cool office. I slept behind that door right there with my M4 and my uh, 9mm, you know, hanging on the bedpost, that kind of thing, because I was the only American in the hotel, and I was kind of exposed here. You know, that's the window to outside right out in front. So, anyway, um, that's, my, that's my office. Next slide, please. 
Okay, these two guys are right outside my office. My office is right here. They're right out there. They're holding hands, and that happens a lot in Iraq. Guys hold hands, and it just is a way in their culture. But these two guys, you know, it was their turn, you know, guarding the corner here. The rest of the hotel goes both directions, and it was just trash. It, it, it's way better in the picture than it is in real life. But um, I always kept these guys fed, you know, bring them goodies from the mess hall and, and told them to watch my door. Next slide. Yeah. This is the ballroom. They had a fancy ballroom in it. And back in the day, you can imagine that chandelier and all that. So lots of our meetings were in the ballroom. And of course, every time we met and there's some Iraqis talking, we had to have a yeah, guy with a headset on. We had to have an interpreter talking into our headsets so we could understand what the Iraqi guy up front was saying. The interpreters were invaluable. You can't do anything without them. You know, it's just, it's just you'd be a dead stop. Next slide. This is our little op cell. Uh, there's an interpreter right there, a guy from Egypt, uh, Air Force guy right here, Army Sergeant Major, another interpreter, that kind of thing, uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel right here. So that's kind of the hovel that they gave us. We had, you know, during the day, the guys came into the hotel where I was, manned the operations, and then at night they all slept in that other compound. And you can see we had some misplaced Bronco fans and Husky, Husker fans. Next slide. Okay, this is looking down the hallway. My office would have been back here, coming in the main door, and then uh, down the hallway, and some of these were offices. Um, some of the Iraqi guys slept in their office also on cots, that kind of thing. And then the three-star, it was a three-star there, and uh, I lost my pointer. And uh, anyway, I was, the, I was the primary advisor for the Iraqi three-star, the senior army guy in Basra province. Next slide. Okay, so that's him, General Mohammed. This is a meeting, this was my assigned seat right here. This is a meeting that happened once a month. And all these guys would come in and everybody was represented, the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard, the, the police guys, um, everybody that had an official role was at this table and it was a way to synchronize their um, capabilities in, in fending off the militias, that kind of thing. So uh, as the primary advisor, I was there at the table. This guy back here in the corner, that's Mike. Mike's talking on the on the microphone, he's talking to me, and he's filling me in on what is going on in the meeting. And uh, Mike was a great guy, I'll talk a little bit more about Mike, but uh, Iraqis are big on flowers, they were everywhere. So, at this first meeting, I'm sitting there, and Mike is interpreting, and uh, the conversation comes up about the poo. And I'm like, the poo, huh? Well, and then this goes on for a while, and they think the poo is over here, you know, and that kind of thing, and I'm thinking, well, why do we give a shit about poo? And so then finally, I asked somebody after the meeting, uh, one of the, our American guys who'd been there before, he goes, yeah, they're talking about where the rockets were launched at, at the combat base in Basra. The POO stood for P-O-O, -O, the point of origin. So I had no idea, and I'm in the meeting going, man, this is a strange meeting. Okay, next slide. Okay, General Mohammed, his office, I spent a ton of time in there. This is a, a three-star, uh, the deputy commander of CENTCOM. You know, they would come and visit him, and I, they came to me. I was the point of contact to set up all these meetings with these guys, and they'd, you know, glad hand and say how everybody was happy that things were going well. Next slide. But you can see the flowers in there. This is our team. And Air Force, uh, Army, Navy, contractors, uh, interpreters, that kind of thing. So we're at the Basra Operations Command. Next slide. Okay. This was their op cell, and this got set up by the Brits. And around this room was all of those guys you saw in that meeting, their organizations were represented so that if something was going on out in the Gulf, some water thing, well, the, the Iraqi Coast Guard guy was represented in there, and they would all kind of get together and decide how they were going to deal with it. Um, this is General Aziz, the local brigade commander, two-star. This guy's the deputy Bayok commander, two-star. This guy came out of Baghdad right here. That Sorry, this is dying on me. Um, anyway, so they would get together and do that and, you know, have exercises like we did. Next slide. And we all advised them. I advised General Muhammad not to throw the horseshoe like that, but <laughs> he didn't listen. It's funny because anybody that's been in the military knows what the supply system is like, right? So my supply officer comes in one time and says, we got a horseshoe set, you know, sent to us in the supply system. Well, nobody ordered that. You know, nobody ordered horseshoes. So I said, well, that's fine. We're going to play horseshoes. So this is right out in front of the Bayok. And... Um, we, you know, 
set up a horseshoe pit here and we played our asses off and the Iraqis loved it. They'd never seen anything like that. So I convinced General Muhammad to come out one time and that's, that's his form. Next slide. That's me. You see this, uh, this guy right here? Okay. okay, he was my roommate for about a month. <laughs> and I woke up one morning about two in the morning and to this noise. And of course, I had, like I said, I had my nine mil right there. I got my carbine and I've got my little angle headed flashlight, you know, so it's dark in that little hovel behind my office. And I flip on the light over there and there's this rat with a cookie in his mouth. And uh, so I'm like, you're not taking my cookies. So anyway, for the next month, he and I fought it out because he booked as soon as he did that. And, you know, I was living in a place where you could, there were lots of access for rats and things like that. And I tried to get spray stuff to fill it in, the foam and all that. So finally, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm sitting in the outer office and I hear a click and I walk in and there he is. So um, I won. But, you know, eventually my, my sleeping quarters back there looked like the Normandy beachhead. I had that much of defensive stuff laid out there. Uh, next slide. So this is just to show you, what do they call those things in, uh, in Arizona, the hay, hay booth, right? So this is a hay booth coming, and you can see the time here, 1028, 412, next slide. You can see how quickly, it's still 1028, and you can see how quickly that moved in. And we would have stuff like that happen, and you know, you just find a place to hide um, when that stuff comes in. Next slide. Okay, this is what I told you about the perimeter. That's an Iraqi tank sitting out on the edge. It's actually a Soviet tank. That's my sergeant major right there. That's an Iraqi sergeant major. And so I just took that picture to show what it looked like around the outer perimeter. Next slide. Okay, this is an American vehicle. Only show you this because there's some of the defensive stuff on there. This thing right here is defensive. This thing right here out in front is called a rhino. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, this, is, this right here is, you know, uh, armor protection protecting the uh, from RPGs on the side or IEDs that kind of thing and so this is a convoy getting ready to head out not our convoy but they were at the at, at the Bayok with us next slide go ahead Bob okay so this is a great example of what they would put on because you know if an RPG round is coming it's going to hit this stuff and the explosion will at least be uh, dissipated by the time it hits anything this is all armor protection here it's armor protected underneath and so, um, same, you got a gunner spot up there with an M240 and uh, antennas for communication and also for identification. We had a thing called a boomerang. The boomerang would pick up uh, rounds coming in and it would tell the driver, actually the TC, the, the we call them TC, the truck commander, where that's coming from approximately and how far out. So you would tell the gunner, uh, hey, it's it's at two o'clock at a hundred meters is where the rounds are coming from. So it's a pretty slick deal. Next slide. So this is some great Americans right here. They weren't my guys. They were in this convoy getting ready to go. There's that boomerang, the thing that would detect where the rounds are coming from. And so this covering behind this guy, um, they had to put that because the snipers were killing our guys like crazy. Um, and. They actually showed us a video in Kuwait before we moved. We spent three days in Kuwait acclimating. Before we moved over, they showed us a video that the Iraqis had taken of their famous sniper, and there was somebody always filming him. So they're filming our guy in a, in a Humvee like this, and then there's somebody saying, Allah Akbar, and then the next thing you know, our guy drops down because he's been hit, he's been killed. And so they started putting this just at least to hide somewhat the gunner in position, uh, in this case, he's got a 50, but he's, this guy's got his foot on the rhino. The rhino is an electronic device, and it was designed to activate an explosive device before you got there. Mm -hmm. they, didn't mind if it, they didn't mind if it blew up the rhino, you know, if it took it out as, as the projectile is coming, but it would protect the guys on board. But I just thought, you know, if you worry about Americans, <coughs> and do we have anybody that will go, these guys will go right here. Mm -hmm. So, next slide. Okay, that's an example of what uh, they were capable of doing, and they had these shape charges. Next slide. Okay, a shape charge is just what it sounds like. It's in this shape initially, and then it is projected by the explosive device, and it shapes in route, and it's like uh, it's like it melts its way through. It's it's so hot and so capable <coughs> that it does this kind of thing. So that was the big threat uh, for vehicles. Next slide. Okay, why is it? kitchen timer on there. Um, a kitchen timer, they would 
to fire rockets on the cheap. Go to the next slide. Yeah, you did. Nice job. Well, everybody recognizes a screw jack right out of their car. So to do it on the cheap, they would take a screw jack out of their car and they would put a piece of wood on it, uh, you know, an L-shaped thing, and then they put a rocket in it. And then they would, you know, somebody would sit there and crank it a little bit and estimate what it's going to take to get it inside one of our compounds. And then the timer was connected through an electrical wire to the back of the rocket. They could set it for 30 minutes and then they could go. And then when the timer, it just provided a little bit of electrical charge to that rocket, launch that rocket. And then, of course, the poo comes in to uh, play at that point, the point of origin. That's where the rockets came from, you know, and typically they're in the back of some pickup or whatever. So we had a quick reaction force. We also had a balloon, I'll show you that in the air, that could pick out where that thing came from. It would pick it up in route. It would try to shoot it down. The first thing it did was activate some of those Sea Whiz things, the 20 millimeter chain guns that were protect protecting the compound. And then, you know, try to shoot it down. But it also would go, oh, it came right from there. They weren't doing counter battery fire at the time, but they were doing quick reaction force. So, the QRF would get out there and there's nobody there, of course. There's a pickup truck, but rockets are gone. They've been gone for a half hour or so. It was a cat and mouse game. Next slide, please. Pretty basic, though. Pretty cheap. So I put this on here, air and ground movement, because you can see Basra and the surrounding area from the air. Next slide. Um, this is what Basra looks like. And, you know, it's, it's just like it looks. It's gray and brown and dirty and nasty. Next slide. A little close up here. You know, they lived in compounds, like lots of wall stuff, and typically their animals would be in there with them, donkeys and, you know, skinny cattle and that kind of thing. So that's, uh, that's you know, some of Basra, a Basra neighborhood from the air. Next slide. I'm talking fast. I'm trying. This is the Basra airport, and we were co-located. This is the combat base, Basra. So COB, C-O-B, Combat Operating Base, Basra. We weren't there. We were over across town at that at that Bayok, the Basra Operations Command in the old hotel. So if we wanted to go to the combat base, we had to do a convoy. So we had to get our, our MRAPs together and get our shit together. And, you know, um, that's where we were exposed to being um, um, hit if along the road by an IED or whatever. So anyway, this is where every, all the good stuff was. This is where we had to get our mail. This And they had a giant mess hall that had everything you wanted. And so we always wanted to go to the giant mess hall because we had a little... We had a mess all like this, you know, and food was in a food was in a tray. But um, so, Cobb Basra was huge. That's where um, the the uh, State Department was set up. All that the British were in there, and this was also the international airport. So they were co-located right there. And uh, the next slide. Okay, this is an MRAP, mine resistant, armor protected. You can see how thick this stuff is. Right? You can see all this thickness. This right here is what they call a combat lock. That combat lock is because underneath this little flap right here, there was an open close your door thing. It was an electric door. Well, you don't want the bad guys walking up flipping the uh, open the door thing. So when you got in, you put that combat lock down and it negated this electric opener. This right here, um, this right here is called a blue force tracker. And this is where I sat, this is where the TC is. Uh, the driver on the other side, the gunner in the center, I'll show you that in a minute. But the Blue Force tracker, uh, everybody understands they do Blue Force and Red Force as far as the military looks at good guys and bad guys. We're the Blue Force. So you could, once you got that up and, and logged in and all that, it indicated where you were and where every other American vehicle was for a 30 mile radius. So if you got in trouble, you'd know that somebody's right over there and you could get a hold of them. So the Blue Force Tracker was very handy to know, well, we got some help if we need it. And they also, you know, the people that coordinated at the operations level could go, hey, there's a force that could help you get out of your trouble. So anyway, that's, a, that's an MRAP. Next slide. Okay, this is an Iraqi hand-me-down Humvee and they didn't really clean theirs up like we did. So this, as you can see, this one's taking a bunch of rounds and, um, you know, they... It's like they, they drove used cars over there, our used cars. Next slide. Okay, this is a side picture of our MRAP. All that stuff up there, we realized this right here is some, you know, uh, PVC pipe. We realized that they could set wires up and they could knock some of this shit off of here, um, which, you know, wasn't good for us. So this was a, a modification that they did while I was there. This young lady right here is about to lower that rhino. It, this is the stowed position, and then he would, when you were going on the road, you would lower that down. 
So uh, lots of armor protection. Next slide. How much do those things cost? No idea. You don't want to know. They were making them, I think, in uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, I think, but it didn't matter to us. More, more the better. They were, they were great protection. Actually, we got hit. We were there a month, and we were coming back from Cobb Bosser, and it was at night, and uh, we got hit, and it blew up the rhino, and it did some damage to the front here, but it did its job. It exploded before we got to it, mm. and uh, and actually that balloon that I was telling you about that it was over Cobb Basra, it saw the guy, cause you, and then because it records everything, it's picturing, it's it's taking a, you know we're we're ten miles away, but it was taking a video, uh, infrared video of what was going on around. Well, you could see the guy running away after he activated it on his cell phone or whatever. So. After that, I told the guys, hey, we can't, we can't stay in the Cobb after dark anymore. We're going to have to come back in the daylight. Mm -hmm. you know, so we would go eat dinner quick, and then we'd hit, head back to the hotel. So we didn't get, and we didn't get hit the rest of the time. We, didn't get, we got some rockets, but we didn't get hit on a convoy. Anyway, this is two interpreters, my sergeant major, and then one of the Air Force uh, captains, I think she was. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. Yeah, cattle across the road. This is, you know, a typical example. Um, you know, you can, and plus, you can see right here all the blast walls. Uh, anyway, these were of concern because, you know, if when the cattle were in the road, we all had to stop. Well, when you're stopped, you're all exposed. You know, so we never knew. And of course, the gunner is is on alert, and everybody's, you know, talking about, do you see anything? That kind of thing. So that was a typical road movement that we would go through. Next slide. Okay, uh, you know, a guy comes running up and he's got propane bottles in his little cart right there and the question is, uh, is he friendly or isn't he? And so he's going that way, big grin on his face. This guy had the same thing. You never know. You don't know whether these guys are friendly or not or what's in the propane bottles. So, you know, we had to operate in there. I will tell you that when we were there, there was less activity. I, I was there in 10 and 11. I was there for 16 months. I was there until we left, until goofy President Obama said we're leaving in December and told everybody telegraph that but um, so there was less of that going on but early on when things like this would happen the US guys wouldn't let them get close they would just open up on them you know with warning shots and that kind of thing and then if they didn't stop they'd shoot them they'd shoot a car they'd shoot because if a car came up behind the convoy you know and the guy's not stopping you don't want to wait until they run into the last vehicle and destroy the last vehicle so I had guys with me on my team that had deployed early, uh, some that had never been there, like myself. And so the guys that deployed early, they're all like on the radio going, hey, we got to take those guys out. And I go, no, we can't do that now. You know, we got to wait. If we're attacked, that was the, the status of forces agreement at the time, the rules of engagement were we had to be attacked first, which is very goofy. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, this is the gunner. <laughs> That's his legs. You can see the radio stack here, and you know, this is a great vehicle. It really was a great vehicle, but this guy had 360 traverse, you know, that kind of thing. Again, the TC spot, the driver spot over here, a very capable vehicle, air conditioned, all that stuff. So, um, from the early days when uh, the Army did not cover itself with glory on how it moved soldiers around the battlefield, they had come a long way. Next slide. Okay, this guy's a Rolling Stones fan. Next slide. <laughs> this is a typical house in route, you know, and they're all trashed and, you know, they got, they're like rich Alabama boys, you know, with two refrigerators in the yard. <laughs> I lived in Alabama. <laughs> so, so I can say that. Anyway, so lots of junk around. There was lots of uh, stuff left over from combat. Next slide. Um, you see this, I'll call it water. Mm -hmm. It ain't. Uh, you know, it probably was at one point, but you see these little trenches right here, and I don't know if you guys can see that. Those are coming from those houses, so that's kind of their sewer system, and it's running between them. But they all have water tanks on the roof. Most of them have uh, satellite dishes, you know, they're watching I Love Lucy or whatever. It's like, uh, kids along route. You know, our gunner would sometimes throw a bag of candy out to the kids, you know, that kind of thing, just for fun. You know, the, and they love that, of course. And, we're making friends, but in the in the early days, the guys would throw them out the back, and they'd have to dodge between vehicles to get the candy. <laughs> Next slide. This was a little military checkpoint. Uh, you know, the highly the highly trained Iraqis, not very. Anyway, you'd, we'd have to go through three or four of these to get to the combat base. Here's some of those, you know, satellite dishes I was talking about. They're everywhere. Next slide. 
Okay, these Iraqis love Chevrolet. Uh, <laughs> these are Iraqi guys. This is us, and we're going into the combat base. And you know, it was a matter of maneuver like this, and it was a matter of you know they're going to get vetted. We got vetted before we went in, but the rules were that there had to be Iraqis with you in your formation, in your convoy, uh, for movement across uh, Basra. So you know, we'd stick them in the back, and they this is a Chevy. Somebody sent them, and so. Uh, you know, you can see how protected we were and how protected they weren't. But uh, anyway, so next slide. Okay, that's a that's a balloon I was talking about. Okay, that thing was capable of uh, seeing, uh, directing fire, um, and it was capable of doing it day and night. That kind of thing uh, it was very effective. And I'll show you the guns that they activated. These are called T walls. They all married up with each other. They were a tongue and groove thing, you know, and they were all and there were. Thousands of them. Whoever had the concrete contract for that is a zillionaire now, but um, very effective. I did find that they're not effective by themselves. I'll tell you that story in a little bit. Next slide. Okay, the balloon. Next slide. Okay, the, this is a bunch of Iraqi guys. You know, I had to go wherever the general went, and uh, he'd get briefed on this, but a rocket had hit the airport there at Basra Airport, so it was a big deal, and they were talking about it that day. Next slide. Okay, here's the 20 millimeter. They had these in all four corners of the Cobb Basra, and they were directed by that uh, balloon I talked to you about. And uh, so they were, and you know, we were, again, we were 10 miles away or so, but at night, you know, if they're firing missiles or rockets into the Cobb or trying to, I'll, I'll go back to that, you know, that crank uh, jack and all that, well, they were horribly inaccurate, as you might imagine. So they do that, and then they'd land short, or they'd go over the cob. But occasionally, they land inside there. Like we were there three days, still in the cob, and they were they were dropping some into the cob. So you know it can be effective. But anyway, we would watch the strings of tracers from these guys. they all four of them were shooting at you know a rocket inbound, and it was pretty damn impressive. It was a great light show. Next slide. There's an up close. And of course, it said no pictures. That's why I took that. Okay, so. The Iraqis and the Kuwaitis, they weren't exactly friends. Um, the funny part, of course, is they're all the same people, you know, from tradition, from thousands of years, they're all the same people, but there are lines in the sand now. And so uh, part of what we, they wanted us to do was get the Iraqis and the Kuwaitis to talk and to do things together. So they didn't trust each other. Mostly the Kuwaitis didn't trust the Iraqis. So we had to do some creative things. And first, the first meeting was out in the uh, outside international waters on a British warship because that's where everybody agreed they would meet rather than, you know, meet at the border or whatever. So next slide. So anyway, that's General Mohammed. That's my guy, you know, who I advise here. And these are Kuwaitis. And you know, the Kuwaitis are still a royal thing. They're Iraq's not, but the Kuwaitis still are. And so they're everybody's related to the Crown Prince or whatever. Next slide. Okay, you know, getting together. Uh, my XO is right there. We got an interpreter sitting there. This guy was uh, out of Baghdad. Uh, he wasn't on my team. Anyway, Iraqis on that side. That's fine. You can go to the next one. And then this is their, you know, this this early meeting was, you know, we're going to be nice to you, you be nice to us, and then we'll talk about another meeting. So, you know, this was an ongoing State Department, Department of Defense effort to try to heal that stuff that had gone on from Desert Storm. Next slide. So the Iraqis have some gunboats. They don't have a navy as such, but you know they these were Italian-made gunboats, I think. And so we had to go out into the ocean for that first meeting and ride out on Iraqi boats. And they had a lot smaller ones. Next slide. And so this is the big day. We're going to go meet the Kuwaitis. This is my guys right here, the, the Iraqis. Next slide. And off I went in one of those out into the Gulf. And uh, we were going to link up with the Brits and then the Kuwaitis. And so. On this one, we're gonna. I think the next picture is of a Kuwaiti boat. Yeah, this is a Kuwaiti boat, and uh, we're pulling up in this thing, and we're gonna go on board and have another meeting. Next slide. So there, they're glad handing each other. Uh, General Mohammed on the left, and the Kuwaiti on the right. Next slide. This is oil, uh, Derek, on the other side, on the Kuwaiti side. This is the international border between Kuwait and Iraq, and you can you can see it's pretty sophisticated, and there were you know mines right there, but. Oil fields don't know where the lines are up on the top of the earth. <laughs> they don't know that this country, you know, stops and that one starts. So these guys will drill, drill sideways because the, 
you know, the huge oil reserve goes across international lines, and so they're all trying to sip in with a straw into the same one. So, so that's what was going on here. Is that's very close to, and and that's a and that's an oil reservoir that is mostly in Iraq, because I got to see the maps of where all these were. But the Kuwaitis were tapping in there. Next slide, because it's worth money. It's all about money. Okay, a day in the life. Next slide. Uh, yeah, me advising General Muhammad, like you know, buy low, sell high, that kind of advice. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the biggest thing that I had to do with him, um, first of all, he ate great food, so I ate every time he ate, but um, was the link between the American forces and his forces. And um, we still had active SF guys in Basra going downtown to a house and taking out bad guy. And it was very sensitive at that time about taking out bad guy because, uh, you know, there had been some incidents. And so the rule was there had to be an Iraqi guy with them. Had to be, and we had some really amazing equipment to tell where that guy was. You know, we'd drive our vehicles through town and guys are listening and they can hear cell phones. And, you know, we could, hear, we could identify cell phones when they were turned off. We have stuff that'll do that. So it doesn't have to be the guys on there. It doesn't have to be in the on position. We can still locate that thing. So the SF guys would come to me and go, hey, we got to go take out this guy because he, whatever, fill in the blank. And I would have this written description of what he had done. And I'd have to go to General Muhammad and say, we need your permission to go take this guy out because he was the senior military guy in the province. And he would take heat. He would take heat from the local you know, politicians. How come you're letting the Americans take out you know somebody and so I'd have to convince him so we had this this sheet and it had, a, it had a dotted line at the bottom we call that the cut line because I would tell him all this stuff that the guy had done and this is the reason we're going to get him the last section was the real stuff the stuff that would kind of give a hint as to how we got this information and you know we didn't necessarily want him to know all that so sometimes if General Muhammad is hesitating I would creep below the cut line a little bit and go well you know this guy killed a bunch of Iraqi military guys or whatever it was and so then I would get the thumbs up and everybody would sign and then I'd get a hold of the SF guys a lot of them were Navy guys Navy SEAL types and uh, I'd get a hold of them and then tell them yeah you can go get this guy the deal about having a Kuwaiti or an Iraqi with them was that the Iraqi had to be in the door first had to go in the door if they're gonna kick the door in or however they're gonna get in and so I asked one of these Navy guys one time I said well what's that like? And he goes, well, we let him get in about that far. <laughs> and then we push him out of the way and, and take care of the rest of it. So anyway, that was a, that was a very, you know, those were, those were times when uh, I felt like I was really earning my dough. And this, this particular uh, tour for me, the 16 months, was my most productive. You know, I was in Europe and all different places, but this one I was making a difference. Next slide. Uh, his office again, they're big on flowers. Flowers everywhere, here's all plastic flowers, but that's a big deal in Iraq. And this guy's a, a State Department official. And so these are, this is a, you know, this would happen once or twice a month. Somebody would show up, next slide. That guy's the US ambassador was, Ambassador Jeffries to Iraq at the time. And his assistant, the lady over there on the left, next slide. So that's there, you know, this is all about supporting the Iraqis and the Iraqi military and the Iraqi government and encouraging them to be doing the right things to make have a productive country. Next slide. Okay, they're in my office. They're about to leave. Uh, you can see they, they got to wear these two like everybody else. And uh, so yeah, that was uh, that was a big day when Ambassador Jeffrey showed up. Next slide. Uh, ballroom again. Uh, lots of meetings about different things and all kinds of activities. There were social activities, medical activities in there. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, this is, there's an orphanage. Uh, the orphans would come in and, uh, you know, there'd be collections done and uh, they'd perform, that kind of thing. Next slide. Uh, I had these on audio, but I don't anymore. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. The 1st Infantry Division was uh, who I was working for when I first got there. 1st ID is a storied infantry division in the Army. It was the 1st. They were the 1st Division formed to go to World War I. They basically formed them on the boats, headed over to Europe. The Army had no divisions at the time, none. And so, you know, they cobbled all this together and they trained. 
And then when they got to France, they trained some more. So the first ID was is famous for that, and uh, they still are in effect. And it's a story division in the U.S. Army, U.S. Army history. But they were in charge. And then this guy's from Texas. You see the T patch, and they came in. The 36th Infantry Division came in and took over for the 1st Infantry Division. I unfortunately didn't get to go home with the first ID. I had to stay with the 36th. The 36th is a National Guard division out of Texas, which was activated and. You know, the Army has all these standing, you know, the 82nd, the 101st, all these standing divisions and all that, but then there are National Guard divisions, and Texas has one, it's so big, it has its own division. This is the division that Audie Murphy was in in World War II, everybody knows Audie Murphy, the most decorated uh, military member in U.S. history. He was part of the 36th, and so they came over, that's a Texas One Star, and this is General Aziz again, more about General Aziz, the local brigade commander, and really the guy who made shit happen in, in Basra. Next slide. Uh, this is what they call the MedCap. MedCap is uh, we supply a bunch of medical things, people, doctors, etc., and help the Iraqis out. We bring the Iraqi doctors in. And so this is all, again, part of, uh, you know, we're helping them develop their ability to do things. And the local population, you know, didn't have much in the way of medical care. So whenever one of these was announced that we were going to put on, there were lines of people trying to get in, they had to stop them. There were too many people trying to get in to see a doctor with their children, that kind of thing. So this is happening, this is the day of it. And you can see all these moms here and how they're dressed. And these are some of our medical people uh, that have come from Cobb, Basra, the big one. They've come to the Bayok where I was, and they're gonna, we're gonna do this, uh, this medical help for the Iraqis, next slide. So they're lining up and you know, uh, we'll make listing what they're there for, that kind of thing. Uh, this is right outside my office. You remember those two flags and the two guys holding hands? Well, it's right there. Next slide. This little guy looked like he needed a soccer ball. Soccer's a big deal, of course, in Iraq, in the Middle East. And so uh, we started this thing where people would send us stuff from the state uh, in the mail, and then we would go to orphanages and pass it out. I'll talk about that in a minute. But this little guy is like, man, you gotta have a soccer ball, dude. And he was. He was kind of hurting. Uh, next slide. The, you know, this is the med cap going on. It's hot and heavy. Next slide. Um, this is an Iraqi doctor, you know, um, looking at a little Iraqi kid right here. These are our medical people, some of them. This was a huge success. Um, they loved it. They, you know, they, we, we could have done it every week and they'd have gone crazy. Next slide. Um, this is a typical, you know, these are shakes and uh, there were two kinds of shakes. There were religious shakes and, and um, not clans, uh, tribes, tribal shakes, two different kinds. And then their headgear indicated if they'd done the Hajj or not, you know, if they'd made that march to Mecca or not. And I don't know all those, but that's why this distinction. So these are guys that we had to work with. And, you know, uh, General Muhammad had a lot of sway with these guys because they had, you know, their, their, their clan, their tribe could cause trouble. And so General Muhammad's always trying to keep these guys from fighting each other or, you know, that tribe is after that tribe. It's very Bedouin-ish still over there, you know, that's, it's just a different culture, just how they operate. So, you know, we had these guys in frequently and we're trying to keep the peace. Next slide. Again, that's in the ballroom. Next slide. I flew to Baghdad in a Blackhawk. Um, and uh, I unfortunately had to ride in the back, um, which is never fun for a pilot, you know, to ride in the back. Um, you can see these guys have their M4s here. They put these special racks in. I don't think they had that in Vietnam. But, um, you know, so these are some pictures of me uh, flying to Baghdad. Next slide. Okay, you know that the, the byproduct of drilling oil is natural gas. You know, it comes, it comes out naturally. Well, we capture it and we use it. They just burn it off. And of course, you can see the smoke. So. You know, you're flying along and half the country is covered by this haze constantly and polluting the air. Next slide. Just, I'm telling the VA about that. So this is Baghdad. And, you know, Baghdad is at the confluence of the, or, or the Tigris and Euphrates go right through there, you know. So, you know, it's, again, it was the Fertile Crescent. It was, you know, a glorious place back in, in history. And so, uh, next slide. Some of this is, uh, you know, where Saddam Hussein, remember he had seven palaces, remember all that, and they never knew where he was and all that, so a lot of those are still wrecked here. But you can see all the, all the water, and so some of the places he would stay, like that one, you know, surrounded by this pretty luxurious stuff. Next slide. I'm talking fast, anybody have to go anywhere? You guys all good? We're 
good. Okay. Um, anyway, you can see this one was destroyed. Was destroyed. You know, and they still haven't done anything about it. But that was one of the places where he'd hang out. Next slide. Uh, you know, Baghdad. Lots of people. Four million, I think it was, and been there forever. If anybody's interested in history, read about the Mongols when the Mongols went into Baghdad in about 1226 or 1227 or whatever, if that has any interest to you, because you know the Mongols, they were badasses, and they, they still have the largest land mass empire of anybody, bigger than the Romans, bigger than the Brits, all that. That's how badass they were, and they were telling the, the uh, Muslims in Baghdad that they needed to pay tribute, and they said, we're not paying tribute, and so the Muslims went in and leveled Baghdad. They think they killed one to two million people, when they did that, and they said they almost eliminated Islam as a religion. It was that much of a lay waste to Baghdad. In fact, the Iraqis still hate the, the people in Mongolia. Next slide. Got a little history note there for you. So the uh, Tigris River going through, looks, looks fine. You know, been there lots of years. Next slide. Okay, this is part of the U.S. compound from the air. These are the living quarters, and you know they were ATCO units, if you will. You know, you lived in a little box. Um, but the, you can see the blast walls in between each of them, you know, because if, if the rocket hits here, it takes those people out, but it doesn't bother these people, hopefully. And so that's how all that was. So this is, uh, you know, you heard about the green zone and all that. Well, there are people that were in the green zone, were living in some of these places, and it was all interconnected. They had a giant PX there, which was like, man, giant PX, how great is that? And uh, so, next slide. Okay, one of the palaces that was destroyed. Next slide. Okay, uh, it was getting to be evening, and you know, you look around, and there's some beautiful sights there, you know. And there, so I took this one. I think the next one's a sunset picture. I was at my BOQ, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you know, um, they have sun in Baghdad too. Next slide. Um, a little bit of the haze I talked about. <coughs> you can see all this and the burn off, and you know, just hung in the air all the time. Next slide. Okay, so. The other thing we did was we helped the military help the civilian population. And so in this thing, this was a day to go out and pass out little space heaters along the border. They're very interested in keeping the people along the border, you know, on their side. Because, you know, they can report Iranians coming across. There was a lot of smuggling going across, weapons and that kind of thing. And so we, we flew out to the border one day in um, Soviet aircraft. That was a trip. And... Uh, we took them little heaters and blankets and that kind of thing. So that's what you're going to see here, pictures of. Next slide. Um, yeah, Soviet Mi-17s. And of course, when I was in a junior Birdman, you know, over in Germany, we were always studying these guys as the threat, you know, of course. And uh, we always talked shit about how bad they were and analog this and pieces of crap. And, and then I ended up in one. So it's like, <laughs> take it all back. So that's an Iraqi door gunner. Next slide. So you can see the helicopters in the background. We landed, and then some trucks met us there. And this is the stuff we're doing the handout for. Um, you know, it's a big, big crowd. They announce it ahead of time, you know, and they show up. Next slide. You can see how varied this mission was. You know, what the things that we did um, as part of the advise assist mission. Uh, General Mohammed. Next slide. Of course, the media came out. General Mohammed, General Aziz, and the local sheikh. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, you can see that security is still an issue. Uh, next slide. Okay, all the ladies, of course, wear the traditional uh, outfits that they do. The kids don't. Young girls that aren't married can still dress, you know, uh, uh, in colorful outfits. Next slide. You'll see a picture here in a minute of how they look. And for some reason, all the guys had to go over there, and all the ladies had to go over there. I don't know what that was about, but you know, so these guys all stood around and uh, and uh, and uh, helped uh, with the offloading stuff. Next slide. Okay, some of the Iraqi dudes. Next slide. Kids with mom. Next slide. Okay, so this is stuff, some of the stuff we handed out. Blankets. Uh, that's a you know kerosene space heater. You can see that she's got her full face face exposed. Uh, next slide. You can see here. This is about the way they could do it: a full face exposure, or just eyes, or from the nose up. That's it. That's all they could do. That's the extent of how they let them dress over there. Next slide. Okay, more of the offloading stuff. Next slide. This is an Air Force uh, uh, sergeant that was my, I, he was my bodyguard. 
he didn't know that, but that's what I told him. You're my bodyguard. If shit happens, you, you got me. And uh, he was a great guy. I called him Shooter. That was his nickname. And, uh, you know, because I, I was always occupied, and I was always right in the middle of stuff with General Muhammad and the other senior leaders. And I didn't have time to look around and see if somebody's, you know, looking my way with bad intent or coming at me. So I told him that was his job. Next slide. Great guy. So this was right next to where we were doing all this, and this is a schoolhouse, and this building is a traditional Iraqi design, and uh, back when in their Bedouin days, the big deal in, uh, in the Middle East about visitors or people going through the desert is if they show up there, you've got to treat them right. You know, you bring them in, you feed them, you give them water, you know, that kind of thing. And they had these little uh, guest house kind of things that they would put them in and feed them. Next slide. This one was made into a school, and so that's me hanging out in school, and these little Iraqi kids going, why is that American here? Uh, okay, next slide, that's fine. This was a delivery of water. This town, the water system broke down. Again, that's General Muhammad. Next slide. Um, and so all these water trucks from the Iraqi military showed up, and this is a big resupply of the town. So we assisted all those efforts to make things better, and you know, we, our presence there, our U.S. presence in uniform, and that kind of thing was a positive connectivity that they could see that it wasn't any more of the Americans are killing all of us, we're actually trying to help. Next slide. Uh, you know, military exercise, everybody gets that. That army, now, I tell people the army is like a football team that practices all week and never gets to play, except occasionally. Um, so, you know, they, we train them how to do military exercises, tabletop type. Next slide. So this was back in that op cell. You can see they, they're doing map uh, stuff. This is a night exercise they're about to do. You can see all the vehicles and people and all that, and their leaders, their captain types, are going to sit around here. And this is a big deal. This was like attended by hundreds of people. They're going to watch this night maneuver, and it's going to be boats and land stuff. Next slide. And so this is a discussion about what's going on that night. There's going to be somebody talking about it to the people that are watching. Next slide. Um, you can see these guys are all lined up, and this is this is how elaborate they get. They set up this tentage right here, and we're all sitting, you know, watching this thing. And uh, next slide, you'll see a couple of pictures. That's what it's like. I mean, this was a big politicians were there, you know, because uh, Iraqi capabilities to fight off militias, you know, wasn't always very great, and so. You know, they had to have the ability to do it on water, on land. They had to do, they had a, a you know, an air force. And so there, all that assistance was, was happening uh, across the board. We had one role and there were other, other teams assisting other roles in, the, in Iraq. Next slide. Okay, a little conversation about who's on first, what's on second. So, you know, this is some swift boats. They did an artillery prep on the other side. They actually have some of those MI-17s that fired rockets from them. And so they did some of that. And then this is, they're going to assault this uh, island. Next slide. This is some SF guys. They're doing some drilling. And then uh, in this case, this day, uh, the U.S. picked them up with the Blackhawks. And we picked them up and inserted them. So sometimes we operated with them that closely. Next slide. So here's the... U.S. Blackhawks coming in to, uh, to move those SF guys. And that, you can see that if you go back one, you can see the boats back here doing their thing. So it's a you know, combined arms effort. Next slide. Uh, more Blackhawk action. Next slide. Okay. The other thing we did was there were orphanages. You know, of course, there were a lot of uh, orphans created by combat that had been going on a long time in Iraq. And so um, General Mohammed got a lot of goodwill in Basra province by attending these orphanages and bringing stuff and they didn't have a lot so we started sending back to the states uh, I even did it to the university I, I, I got mobilized out of uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University I was still in the guard at the time and so they mowed me and so anyway I sent back and said hey if anybody wants to send stuff over you know here's the things that would go well soccer balls and that kind of thing and so that stuff started to pour in from several different sources and so we, every, about every three months, we had enough stuff compiled. They'd tell General Muhammad, hey, we can go make another, another visit to an orphanage. Next slide. So this is what it was like. You know, uh, all these kids were all dressed up, and they were all singing, and they were all, you know, very glad to have us there, and that kind of thing. And General Muhammad was getting a lot of uh, positive stuff out of it, and which, is, which was what our job was. Our job was to 
may have them trust the military. You remember Saddam used to wear a uniform and be all that, and the military was all, you know, not to be trusted. Well, we're trying to make it so they could be. Next slide. Uh, yep, the kids. Great kids, actually. Okay, this is a little shameless advertising. Um, you know, this is who I worked for over here, and then, you know, I said, hey, send me one of, the, one of our banners. So I said to the kids, hey, hold that up, and I'll send it back. Because, you know, there were people that worked there that were sending stuff in the mail, and they were spending their own money and all that, so I sent that back and, and said, yep, you guys are getting some future pilots right there. Next slide. Okay, and this thing, you know, we made up some signs. This was the Texas folks. This was a later one that the 36th Division was in. So uh, this place here had sent us a bunch of stuff, and so I would have these kids hold up. You know, and I'd send it back, and the people would rub it at the other end. Next slide. Oh, go back to that one. One of them, one of them sent me one that had a cross in it, and of course, that looks a little crusaderish. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, somebody said, "Hey, you can't do that." Okay. So <clears throat> I took my beanie. Next slide. Yeah, a stack of stuff that we took uh, into the orphanage. Uh, next slide. Me and General Muhammad basking in the glory. Next slide. Um, this was a different orphanage, and I have I, my my ex-wife and I adopted a couple of kids from Cambodia years ago, and uh, it was a great experience. But I'm thinking these two right here, if I could just adopt those two and bring them home. But um, no, they they had a huge need there. They had orphans all over the place, and uh, you know it's a they were very appreciative of what we did. Okay, you recall I go ahead, you can go. You recall I said they had a, you can, next slide, um, the traditional building where they would greet guests and feed them and all that. That's what this was. And so they made one of these in Basra, and then one day we got to go uh, try it out. Next slide. So they'd lay all the food out on the floor. You'd sit down cross legged that kind of thing, and everybody's reaching around and eating the food collectively, and it was a great experience. Next slide. Um, you can see here that was a State Department guy, uh, General Aziz back over there, the two-star brigade commander. But, you know, they ate fine. You know, this was good chow. And uh, they, a lot of lambs paid the price, but that's like <laughs> <laughs> This was in the dining facility in the Bayok, in that old hotel. And it was in the back. And so we would eat back there with the Iraqis sometime. And I, I got to tell you, they know how to throw food together. They've been doing it for a while. This was a little bit right after. That's fine, Bob. Uh, you know, everybody stand around and have a little bit of fruit or whatever. Uh, next slide. Okay, General Muhammad's uh, dining room. And that's a quarter, whole quarter of a lamb. Good. And, uh, you know, whenever anybody was coming, any of the GOs or whatever from the Cobb or from Baghdad, I, of course, had to be there. And this is how we ate. And he had three guys that were his cooks, and uh, you know, or he'd just invite me to lunch and all that stuff. So anyway, the rest of the slaves were all not eating like this. Next slide. They had this big outdoor thing one time. All the officers in Basra. Um, and this thing went on for a half a mile, not really, but um, you can see same thing. Um, you know, General Muhammad put this on for all his officers. Next slide. This was our little dining facility, and. Uh, you know, we ate out of, uh, there were tea rations, they were in a, in a square pan, and they were heated up in the pan, and then, you know, these guys would serve it. Nothing like the, nothing like at the combat base. So anyway, uh, and the bad part was, like, as you walked down and got your food afterwards, you'd pass by a bunch of junk food. They just threw all kinds of junk food out, and you'd fill your pockets, and I'd feed it to my Iraqi guards. But anyway, so that was our dining facility. They gave us two beers at uh, Super Bowl time. <laughs> Two, and then you had to turn the cans back in. I mean, like, where are your cans? And I kept one of my beers for a while, and I was getting phone calls. Where, Sir, where's your can? We have to turn the cans in. Next slide. Yeah, it's like that. Not quite like Vietnam, when they were stacking uh, black label beer right on the, on the pier. Um, okay, <laughs> this is a strange deal. That's Mike. Mike, my interpreter. This is one of my last days in country. And I said, you know, we never went downtown unless we were in armored vehicles and we had a purpose, you know, to do something, to drive through town or whatever. I told Mike, I said, you know, I haven't gone downtown at all, you know, and so he goes, okay, well, put some civilian clothes on, we'll drive you down, he and another interpreter in their car, and so this is a hotel that had a, a you know, a, uh, you know, ser serve yourself kind of thing, so I'm completely off the reservation, I'm completely downtown, nobody knows I'm there, if it had gone bad, I'd be, you know, still in Leavenworth. Next slide. 
Okay, uh, we had some breaks. And it's just playing football. These guys were the MPs, and this is my team right here, and this is me, because when you're the colonel, you get to be quarterback. It's just how it works. And, uh, you know, we, you know, the MP guys are all studly, and we were okay. We held our own, um, but we had some fun doing that. You can see the blast stuff behind us right there, and it's not exactly a great football field. Next slide. Okay, this is the thing I did. This, and this broom thing was in my office, and it had a couple of things hanging from it. I decided, okay, if you screw up, you carry the broom for a week, and you got to put something on there that is from you, something that represents you. So we did that the whole time we were there, and so this, this, this was one of the interpreters. And so there, see somebody who's a ZZ Top fan, that was the easiest one to see. Somebody put a CD in the music they liked, but... You know, it was a great morale builder kind of thing. We had fun with it. Next slide. Okay, at the Cobb, you could order cakes like this. Okay, we had our logo on there, and the Sergeant Major was having his birthday, so uh, next slide. Okay, this is a captain out of the Oregon Guard, and he just had to dress up like an array. It was his last day in country. He goes, I just got to dress up like this before I go. So anyway, that was Steve. Next slide. Toby Keith. Toby Keith came and entertained. Uh, mm -hmm. Joan Jett, Joan Jett and the Blackheart. Mm -hmm. Anybody know the song, I Hate Myself for Loving You? You ever heard that one, anybody? Any younger yeah. people here? <laughs> I had Joan sign it. It says, Colonel K, I hate myself for loving you, right above her picture. Yeah, that's good. I framed it, of course. Anyway, Toby Keith has two kinds of songs. He has songs that he publishes and sings to everybody else, and then he has songs with bad language in them <laughs> that he used for us GIs. Next slide. Next slide. The, you can see why the dining facility at the combat base, yes, we would hang out there a lot whenever we could. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So, you know, Basra, and you know, there were times when we, when I would ride with General Muhammad in his up-armored uh, Toyota Land Cruiser. And so, you know, it was, it was just me and my interpreter. There were no other Americans in this convoy, and they would move him around. You know, his, they could, so you, it, bad guys couldn't tell which one, which vehicle he was in, and whether he was second or fourth or whatever. And so I got to be downtown sometimes uh, doing different things, and, you know, again, I was the only American there. Um, so anyway, this is the street scene, and you can see the dress, you know, guys and girls. Next slide. Okay, and you can see the donkey in traffic here. He's got his space. Next slide. And these were, these were special bomb-sniffing donkeys. That's not true. <laughs> I just made that up. Everybody's going, bomb sniffing donkeys? Do they have that? Anyway, this guy's, you know, walking. He was right out my window, and I'm like, okay, you get to be a star. Next slide. You know, some of what Baghdad looked like. Next slide. Same thing, you know, remember uh, those scenes from Baghdad when they were pushing stuff over and all that, and, you know, when the war was over, well, they had some of that in Basra. Next slide. Okay. A typical street corner, you know, we're turning the corner, here's our Iraqi guy that's with us in the convoy, and, you know, this is, uh, you know, somebody selling turnips or whatever, but, you know, there were guys there with cell phones, and like I told you early on, if you saw a guy with a cell phone back in 2005, you, you didn't let him stand there. You know, somebody took him out. Well, I had guys that were just, you know, they were going crazy that there could be a guy talking on a phone. It, you know, and we turn a corner like this, and it's like, man, we can't take that guy out. It's just not going to go. So anyway, that's a typical street scene. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, some kids along the way. You can see what fun they had to play in. Trash stuff all over. Uh, Basra street scene. They're big on flags. Flags everywhere. Next slide. Same thing. You know, shooting out the door of the general's um, up-armored Land Cruiser. Next slide. This is Saddam Hussein's yacht, one of several that he had. It was tied up in the harbor there in the Shad Al Air Hotel, or uh, Shad Al Air Waterway. Next slide. Soccer kids, you know, this was a big deal. You can see how terrible it is. And we, we had uh, soccer teams sending us uniforms from the States, and we'd hand them out to these teams when we saw them. Next slide. Uh, you know, more Basra. Next slide. Okay, this is real common. There's just junk piled everywhere, and you'd see armored vehicles that have been destroyed. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can see the critter head there and the, the uh, backbone and all that. So, um, very junky place overall. You know, it's very just trashed. Uh, next slide. Okay, 
law enforcement was a big deal too, fixing the military and fixing the law enforcement. So I don't know if you remember, but you know, after we took over, we disbanded the military, big mistake, uh, disbanded the police, big mistake. And then it's like, okay, we're gonna put them back together again. And then the police, a lot of the militias turned into policemen. And you know, it was, that was a mess. That was part of the mess that occurred after, um, you know, we took them down and then tried to put them back together. So this was an ongoing effort to try to put professional policemen in roles over there. Next slide. We'll do several of these in a hurry. This was a graduation ceremony. Next slide. Okay, more cops. Next slide. Okay, Oops. if you back up one. This is outside my office. This is the old hotel. I'd be standing right on the porch. And these guys were militia types. And so they're being brought in and they're gonna be, they're gonna get biometrics on them, you know, fingerprints and eye stuff and uh, that kind of thing. So they can identify them and they can see if that was the guy who sent a bomb to Baghdad, you know, that kind of thing. Next slide. Um, this was one night when that happened and you can see all these young people, a lot of young people in the crowd, but these are uh, tribes fighting tribes. And so the police and the, and the army guys would round them all up and they'd bring them to the Bayok and uh, you know, then they, again, they take names and all that stuff and then, you know, they just kind of disappear in the night. I don't know if they were killed or what. Next slide. So these were real bad guys. And my, my uh, sleeping quarters right on the other side of that wall. So the way to get in the hotel would have been right here. They come around the corner and these guys would go into the, we had a prison cell or two at that old hotel and they would go in there and they do lots of biometrics on these guys because they, for some reason, they think they were involved in something. You know, I didn't get to, I didn't get to see that, but you know. So, and then the big deal too was these guys were smart enough to go, you know, burn themselves with a cigarette and go look what the Americans did. They tortured me. You know, they burned me with cigarettes and all that. So it was a cat and mouse game that they played with these bad guys. Next slide. Okay, this was an eighteen wheeler that showed up out in the yard. You know, the bigger compound. You can see back here the glass walls, the bigger compounds out here. This 18 wheeler shows up out in the yard with a bunch of dead vehicles. Next slide. So, in the back, they got this huge drum. Well, this drum was full of oil, and they were smuggling oil across the border because it's, you know, worth some money. So, they had a bunch of turnips or whatever, you know, stacked up behind there, and it got intercepted at the border, um, you know, on inspection, and then they brought it to, the, to our compound. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. General Aziz and General, and I can't remember his name, I wish I did, but he was the deputy and this guy was the brigade commander. So I get a call one night from the, the division operations cell and they said, look, we've got some CIA people downtown. The CIA has some people downtown and they have a customer, meaning somebody that they picked up that they want to interrogate or whatever they're gonna do with them, make them disappear. And they've been in a car accident and they don't want the Iraqi police to show up. They can't see what's inside our vehicle. They can't see this guy. And so they called me up and they said, the division did, because at the time, you know, the division didn't tell, what the CIA, tell the CIA what to do. But, you know, the CIA called the division and said, have you got a QRF or whatever? You know, we can't let the police come and take this. Or, and the guy said, and the CIA said, or we're gonna have to go kinetic, meaning we're gonna have to shoot our way out of here. So they call me up and go, can you do anything? So General Aziz was uh, almost constantly around, around Basra in his up armored Humvee with a convoy of about six or eight. And I had his cell phone, he had mine. I called him up and I said, hey, this is bad. And he goes, well, where are they? So I got my interpreter and nobody in that op cell could know I was doing this. So my interpreter and I go in the op cell and we're looking on the Basra map going, it's right here at this intersection. So we got all this information called General Aziz back. He makes it with his army guys, makes it there to the CIA ahead of the cops and takes them back out, you know, takes them out and escorts them and then get them back into Cobb Basra. And so the next day I got a CIA guy in my office with a CIA coin going, you saved a lot. You saved a lot, uh, international incident, a big mess the night before. So again, this was, you know, oh, and, yeah. Anyway, this was, you know, I, I, I had an impact when I was over there. Uh, this is some of that, what do they call that stuff? The trick, the, the Christmas time uh, um, Chex Mix that my wife sent. These guys were killers on Chex Mix. You could convince them to do anything. Oh, and you know, Iraqis don't drink, you know, Muslims don't drink. So, 
I told these two guys, I said, look, I'm going home for Christmas break. What do you want me to bring you? And they go, they start trying to describe something to me. And General Z spoke great English, but he, but he didn't know the word flask. You know, so he's talking about this thing and, you know, the, and I'm like, you mean a flask? Yeah. So I bought, I got them both flasks and I had their names engraved on them when I came back home to Prescott. And then I took them back and I put uh, Captain Morgan in both of them and filled them up. And that was their Christmas present. Next slide. So I get a call one night, not a call, a knock on my door. It's like 11 o'clock at night. I'm asleep in the back of my place. And there's two guys at my door and there's no interpreter because I'm you know by myself and they're trying to tell me stuff and I'm trying to understand stuff and I got my robe on and you know I, I, they get out the words Iraqi spy plane I'm interested I'm interested in an Iraqi spy plane so I have to go get my interpreter up um, and so get put my uniform on and we go into the ballroom and this thing is leaning up against the wall I'm like, holy shit so um, you know, I don't know what it is for sure. I know it's a drone, but I don't know who's and all that stuff. So I took this data plate off. Next slide. You can see I took the data plate off, and it didn't, it didn't say, you know, made by Raytheon. None of that shit. <laughs> it, you know, it had a couple of numbers on there in English. You know, I'm thinking, but that's kind of an international thing. I mean, it's not necessarily that it came from, uh, you know, the U.S. And so uh, I'm trying to figure that out. I took these pictures. Next slide. That's the camera up front. You know, the glass had been broken. Next slide. Uh, a close-up. That's what it had right there. You know, just data numbers. So I sent this to a Division. Next slide. I sent it to Division, and uh, about an hour later, I get this back, and they go, yeah, that belongs to the Navy, and they'd like to have it back. <laughs> I go, okay. So these guys that brought it to me, they wanted, they wanted money for it. And... They had gotten it from a farmer who found it, you know, in his farm field, and he wanted money for it. So, you know, I said, okay, well, I'll talk to the people who have money, and we'll see what we can do. So, flying back and forth, I flew the first time. It was uh, Dallas to Leipzig, Germany, to Kuwait, and then into Iraq. This is Leipzig at my Christmas break. This is me returning after Christmas, uh, landing in Leipzig, which is outside of Berlin. Next slide. This is Kuwait. This is outside the mess hall. You can see they've almost tilted the uh, thermometer. Next slide. Okay, this was in Shannon, Ireland. One of my transits back and forth was uh, through Shannon, Ireland. This bar was set up there, and they shuffled us all into this large area, right? All of us off the airplane while it was going to refit and clean and, you know, get refueled and all that. And we're like, Yahoo, and then the bar was closed. No drinking. That was the other thing is general order number one is no alcohol in theater. You know, and that was completely different from like Vietnam and other stuff, you know, where drugs and alcohol became an issue. There was just no alcohol. Now, don't get me wrong, alcohol made it into theater, but uh, the general order number one said no. I had this guy, I had this guy, are you guys okay? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's great stuff. You guys okay? Great. Okay, so um, while I was in the U.S., I hadn't been to Iraq yet. One of the guys that worked for me in the Alaska Guard uh, said, he sent me an email and said, he goes, what I don't want you to do is go down and buy one of those apple juice, plastic apple juice containers and drink the apple juice and then fill it up with booze and then squeeze the air out and then tape the lid on really tight and send it to me. Because what was happening was when it arrived in uh, Baghdad, it would get x-ray, go across the x-ray machine. Well, if it looked like one of those apple juice things, you know, but if it looked like a fifth of Jim Beam, it's popping out. Mm -hmm. So, of course, that's how that stuff got into theater. And uh, and I actually had a, guy, a major that worked for me that uh, had that happen. He Somebody sent him a couple of fifths of booze, and they, they popped it out. And then it comes to me. I was his boss, and it comes to me through the channels. And they said, hey, you need to take action against this guy. So what they had was a picture of the x-ray with the clearly you could see two-fifths of booze in there and then they had opened the box and the two-fifths of booze are sitting next to the box and then a picture of his address you know sent to him and uh, so I got all this and so I called him in and he was just nervous as a cat you know he was just like hey, career's over and you know the deal was you could say I didn't I had no idea they were gonna I, I told him not to send that stuff to me so you know I I let him pass next slide Okay, this is landing back in Dallas, and they, uh, you know, we were we were on civilian chartered airplanes coming out of Kuwait, 
And so, um, you know, it was a regular airliner, but it was, you know, U.S. government airline. And so anyway, they bring these fire trucks out and shoot them over our airplane as we taxi in. Next slide. Okay, this was, um, that, this, I was at Embry-Riddle when I got mobilized. So this is my chief flight instructor, this is one of the professors, and that's me, and we're in our, our twin. This is them taking me to the airport to start this big odyssey. So anyway, that's a cool picture. Next slide. Okay, Operation, it turned into Operation New Dawn. From Iraqi freedom, it became New Dawn for the last few months. This is the 36th ID, the Texas, the Texas boys um, taking over. Next slide. In fact, General Austin, who's now the, oh, this is great. Just come and take it. Anybody know about that slogan? The Spanish came to the Texans at one of their compounds, and they said, we need that cannon. You guys got to give us a cannon. And so they sent back the come and take it, and that has become the 36th ID's logo. And, and next slide, you'll see how they modified it. Here they are to come and take it. Next slide. Great guys. It was great to work with them. Okay, this is me leaving uh, at the end. And I'll tell you, I have to tell you, the hottest I've ever been ever by far is walking up to the back of a C-130 on the uh, on the Cobb Basra on the airport tarmac with all four turning and burning. And the OAT, the outside air temperature is 115, and all four of these engines are turning. And they bring you around and they walk you in. This is what's happening right here. But they bring her out, walk you in, and by the time you get that last 30 yards, your face is burned. I mean, you're you, you all of a sudden are red to get in there. Next slide. So this is me. Um, I'm going home for the, the last time after 16 months. I did get to go home a couple of times. You know, Christmas time and one other. And uh, so, yep, I'm ready to head home. Next slide. And then I had to get a picture of that hanging in the back of the 130. I think this is the last slide. That's Mike. You can see he's got Mike right there. That's not his real name. It's some, some version of Mohammed, like most of them. And, uh, but I couldn't have done my job without Mike. And Mike and I became very close. Um, and Mike, you know, it's, you hear about the, the people that help the people in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they want to get them, they want to bring them out and all that. Mike wanted to come out. Mike wanted, you know, because they're risking their neck to do this. You know, the Mike thing is about not letting them know his real name, that kind of deal. And so, you know, he, he contacted me for months afterwards, and we tried to do all kinds of things, and I couldn't get him out. He ended up working for the State Department over there, because, you know, the State Department stayed. They shrunk down and all that stuff. Um, but Mike was fantastic, and I asked him one time, I said, how did you learn, because he, he spoke great English. How did you learn such great English? And he goes, watching cartoons. <laughs> and that's how he started, watching cartoons as a kid, and that's how he picked up most of it. But... You know, I still, I'm still in contact with it. Next slide. I think that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay, there that was. was. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. These spies. How did you? Uh, what was the spy effect? Spy. Spy. S P Y. Spy. Bad guys. You know, uh, getting inside your, getting inside your operation. Well, there's counterintelligence stuff going on all the time, if that's what you mean. Yeah. We're trying to identify people that are trying to get information from us. They were very sophisticated in that respect. You know, the Iraqi army was on our side, allegedly. But they had guys walk through that old hotel where I lived in with a backpack, our guys, and they would listen to everybody's phone so that if you had a dirty Iraqi guy, which they suspected in the building I was in, if you had a dirty Iraqi guy, they could pick up his phone calls, yeah. and he's talking to militias about what's going on the next day. So there was that counterintelligence thing going on all the time. Right. And that, that was one of the most secret things they ever did to me when they called me and they said, we got to tell you what we're capable of doing here so you know why we're in here. And so it's amazing what they're capable of doing to pick up people and what they're talking about and what they're saying. You guys have seen it all on the news. Like, how did they get those guys to bomb that? Was it in Germany? They bombed that nightclub or whatever? Remember they had them? They had a voice recordings of those guys talking about doing the bombing. So yeah. They're very good at that. Anybody so, else? Anything? So, Jim, it's been, you know, Jerry. Ten, ten, uh, Jerry, I'm sorry. Jerry, That's okay. It's been, uh, Mom did that, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just don't call me Ray. Right. Uh, so it's been over 10 years since you've been there. I mean, what's the status of the situation over there now? We're kind of gone from there. It's disappeared from the news. I'm just kind of curious, 10, 15 years later, what is the status of Iraq now? I, I believe there's still about 5,000. U.S. guys in there and combinations of contractors and military, mm -hmm. and they are attempting, you know, the individual pickups. The, then they're doing much of the counter surveillance, yeah. 
to try to identify stuff that might be starting to gel. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what happened with ISIS. Remember, we right. left and, right. and for two years there wasn't much going on. The next thing you know, ISIS is trying to start a caliphate. So they're trying to stop that. They're trying to see if they can pick it up before it gains traction. So yeah, they're still an active military force Presence in Baghdad. There. And they don't like to talk about it. That's why we don't hear about it, right. you know. They like to do all that stuff. And of course, they're operating in Syria. And so Syria and Iraq, are, they share a border. So right. we're listening from there. Jared? Oh, Thank Syria, you. what? I don't understand. Balloon, Hold on a second. Hold on. Is that balloon vulnerable to ground fire? Yeah. yeah it was. Shot down there? Nope. Never did while I was there. So I, I don't understand why we're involved in Syria. I thought they were the, like the enemy or something, right? So we keep having because of things. ISIS, because that's where they would retreat into. That that no man's land, Iraq, Syria, you know, that nobody likes. It's all desert and all that stuff. That that's where we're still active. But yes, everybody's not. What's a, Assad? Is that the president of Syria? And you know. Um, He's not a friend to the U.S. He did lots of negative things, you know, but we have decided we're going to go ahead and, and do incursions into Syria so that ISIS doesn't get the... It's just like in Vietnam, you know, going into Cambodia, because that's where the Vietnamese would build up. And, you know, if you can't go in there, then they get to build up and do whatever they want, and then they can infiltrate into Iraq. So, you know, it's being, it's being proactive is why the only reason we're still in Syria. But, but you know, you don't, if you call somebody and say, how, much, how many people are in Syria, and... What, what are our current operations? The only way we'd hear about it is if they took out a bad guy and it became public. You know, it was a big deal. Where That's do we, it. Where do we operate out of? Do we operate out of Iraq? Then? Iraq. Oh, wow. Yep. Well, That's another are, reason to keep, you know, friendly, mm -hmm. friendly uh, stuff with Iraq. So the only way everything's going to work out is if all the tribes start holding hands and doing kumbaya, otherwise it's just going to be a constant thing forever, isn't it? Yeah, their government, you know, they have supposedly have a democratic government and they have a parliament and that kind of thing, but it's fraught with uh, factions, you know, and so that's their biggest problem right now is they're factionalized and so yes, they would have to be, you know, and there are people over there who want a strong man again. They want, you know, a Saddam Hussein type because they struggle so much with making a democracy work with agreeing in meetings, with making laws because of their religion and because of their uh, tribes. They don't get along, they don't agree. And so, you know, you can imagine it's a little like us now, throwing all those people in the same place and making them, you know, vote and pick a, pick a, a government. It's like, it's tough to do. So we just are, you know, we're in the Middle East as a preventive measure now. When, when did we actually pull out? I can't remember. Two well, December of 11 is when we left Iraq. And that was the big deal. It was six months out, President Obama said, we're leaving Iraq in December of 11. And of course, everything started to slow down because these guys all pulled back. Yeah, I'll reload, and yeah. Out of that popped ISIS. Hmm. Those guys have been hating each other for thousands of years. Indeed. And you think, you think they're all going to hold hands with ages? Nope. Not a million, not no, another million years. we just don't want it to spill over, you know, and get into something bigger. You know, that's the deal, because you're not going to make them get together. But great stuff, Jerry. Thanks. Great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks a lot. I'm going to run this off. Okay.